Joining us now to analyze today's headlines is Courtney Morris. She's an assistant professor of African American and Women's Studies at Penn State University. Hi, Courtney. Hi, Sonali. A United Nations agency has just released a damning report on Gaza, warning that it could be uninhabitable within five years. According to the report by the UN Conference on Trade and Development, quote, the social, health, and security related ramifications of the high population density and overcrowding are among the factors that may render Gaza unlivable by 2020. Nearly two million Palestinians live in one of the most densely populated regions in the world. Several years of aggressive and bloody wars by Israel, coupled with a strict blockade, have rendered the territory on the verge of collapse. The report warned that it was even too late for aid agencies, saying, quote, short of ending the blockade, donor aid will not reverse the ongoing de-development and impoverishment in Gaza. Water, food, shelter, electricity and employment are all in severely short supply. Well, Courtney, how serious is the situation in Gaza and how seriously will the U.S. take this report, given that Israeli policies in Gaza are carried out with U.S. blessing and, and weapons? Well, I mean, I think the situation is pretty clear, is pretty critical, as the report demonstrates, and, and this is something that uh, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, and human rights organizations have been saying for quite some time now to no avail. And the numbers are, are really just staggering. I, I just have to share this with you. I mean, 20,000 homes, 148 schools, 15 hospitals, 45 healthcare centers were destroyed last year during Operation Protective Edge. Uh, 247 factories, 300 commercial centers destroyed. Unemployment is 44%. Um, and the military operation last summer has effectively destroyed whatever was left of the middle class in Gaza. And so, uh, and you combine that with the fact that from December of last year, well into uh, the spring of this year, the Israeli government was withholding uh, Palestinian tax revenue from the occupied territories in retaliation for the Palestinian Authority attempting to seek uh, membership in the International Criminal Court in The Hague in order to try to force Israel uh, to honor the existing peace accords that it has with the Palestinian Authority. I think that it's, it's pretty obvious that what's happening here is uh, essentially a tactic of collective punishment of the Palestinian people. Right. Uh, and. Uh, and the message is clear. If you don't get out, we'll starve you out. And court hearings have begun this morning in Baltimore, Maryland, and the police-related death of 25-year-old Freddie Gray. Gray died days after he was arrested by police in April from critical spinal injuries. His death sparked one of the biggest public rebellions nationwide over the past year. Six officers who were indicted in connection with Gray's death will find out in the hearings whether they will be tried separately, see any of their charges dismissed, or whether the prosecutor will be recused. Baltimore State's attorney Marilyn Mosby announced a surprisingly large number of charges against the six officers in what was one of the very rare cases of police being legally questioned for their role in a fatal encounter. Hundreds of people are expected to protest outside the courthouse and news media are reporting that there is a heavy police presence. Courtney, do you think that there will be enough news coverage of this court case just because six officers have been heavily charged doesn't mean any of them will actually be convicted, right? Oh, well, certainly. I mean, of course, there, you know, all of this really remains to be seen, and a, and a lot can happen during the course of a criminal prosecution. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, certainly there is reason for cautious optimism. I mean, it's certainly the first time in recent memory that we've seen police officers uh, facing this number of criminal uh, charges for the wrongful death of an unarmed civilian. So, you know, I, I do think for those reasons, it will certainly continue to attract a great deal of media attention. But more importantly, I think what we're seeing here is that the people of Baltimore are very angry about the death of Freddie Gray. And they're also very angry about uh, the long history of uh, abuses of uh, civil rights of civilians in the city at the hands of the police that have really never uh, seen uh, been subjected to criminal prosecution. So I think really what's going to be the determining factor here is the people of Baltimore continuing to put pressure uh, on the legal system there to ensure that uh, that justice is served. And finally, a 17-year-old transgender student is facing the wrath of hundreds of fellow students and parents in her Missouri school and community all for using the bathroom. Leela Perry has found herself at the center of a firestorm after she used the girls' locker room during a phys ed class. She had previously been using a unisex faculty bathroom. When her use of the facilities prompted a two-hour protest by fellow students, Perry hid in a school counselor's office worrying for her sa own safety. A Christian organization named Alliance Defending Freedom has taken up the fight against Perry's use of the bathroom. 
The Missouri Gay Straight Alliance Network plans a rally in support of her later this week. In early July, the U.S. Department of Justice ruled in favor of the rights of a transgender teenager in Virginia to use the bathroom assigned to the gender he identifies with, not his biological sex. Several school districts around the country have begun adjusting their bathroom use policies in line with that decision. Now, Courtney, it seems like a trivial matter, but given the high level of violence that trans youth face and also the high rates of suicide, how important is the right to just use the bathroom of one's choice? About as important as the right to sit wherever you want to sit on the bus. I mean, mm. I, I think that this is clearly much bigger than a bathroom. I think the real issue here is whether trans youth have the right to be who they are in public and to be accepted by their peers and by their community. And unfortunately, uh, in this young woman's case, she's finding that, in, that the answer is still no. Um, you know, none of the parents or the students who have been protesting about her presence in, the, in these spaces has complained about her being aggressive or threatening to any of the other young women in that space. So it's not about safety. It's not about personal choice. It's about policing people's uh, gender performance. And that, I think, is really a problem. Uh, and we're seeing the effects that this has on trans youth. I mean, just over the last year, the data has been overwhelming that, uh, you know, approximately it's estimated that 41 percent of trans youth have attempted suicide as the result of these kinds of forms of exclusion uh, and by their communities and discrimination in the public sphere. And so this is really so much bigger than a bathroom. Courtney, thanks as always for joining us. We'll talk to you next week. Bye, Sonali. Courtney Morris is an assistant professor of African-American and women's studies at Penn State University. This is Uprising. We'll be right back.